Okay, mineral systems are excellent geophysical targets, and they can be imaged using a variety of different methods. Um, you can use IP, you can use magnetics, you can use gravity, all sorts of electrical methods. And if you really want to try to get the entire picture of uh, your uh, mineral system, you can even go to the lengths of using magnetotellurics. It gives you a pretty good idea depth-wise of what you're looking at and what the entire package may be. But it's extremely important that you integrate your geophysics with your geology and with your geochemistry. What, we, what, it, what you see in the mineralogy, what you see in the geochemistry, we have to be able to explain in the geophysics. If we do not get this lining up, it means that there's something wrong with either one, two, or all of it, and that it's time to take a hard look and revisit what the model actually is. So it's very important to keep this in mind. Uh, with all the latest <laughs> developments in technology, the ability to combine results from various 2D and 3D surveys and acquisitions uh, is uh, very, very strong because now we can put everything in a 3D space and we can start to see where these things correlate, where they don't correlate, where the differences are, and try to figure out why we have those differences. And what, we're going to, what I'm going to do with this talk is we're going to look at a number of case histories. Most are going to be from porphyries. There will be one set X one where we're correlating all these different geophysical methods with the drill results that are available at the time and also with uh, geochemistry where appropriate. So uh, we'll start with a brief overview of porphyry systems. Uh, I believe uh, everyone in this audience probably knows more about porphyries than I do. Uh, the first case history will be from Argentina, be followed up by one from Chile, then one from Peru, and then finally a set X one here in uh, BC. So as a quick overview, uh, porphyry systems can, uh, are large systems that include epithermal and scarring deposits. Each associated feature has a distinct mineralogical assemblage that can be characterized by various geophysical responses. It's important to recognize where one is in the overall system uh, when designing a geophysical program so that we can see and get some expectation of what we think we're actually going to be um, able to determine and highlight. It's important to have a, geo a geological model going forward. Even a simple cartoon like Silito's model on the left uh, can help define various geophysical signatures. Um, on the top right, the blue is an area of uh, magnetic response. The light blue is where we've had, it's still magnetic, but it's not as magnetic. And then we get areas where the magnetite has been destroyed. In a porphyry system, what we're mapping out with magnetics tends to be the alteration and where the alteration is centered. And it correlates directly into whether we have the potassic core in uh, Silito's model and the, the various system or the, the various alteration products that are going on as the system is in place. The lower left is the chargeability. So we will get a chargeability response and a, and a conductivity response where we get the mineralizing veins and the systems in there. And these can all point to different spots, different phases, and where one is in the porphyry system. Uh, if we go to another model, this one from Lowell and Gilbert, where they actually break down some of the mineralogy uh, on the left, on the right you can see what is uh, the percentage of conductive ma materials. And based on this, we can start to see what type of uh, geophysical response we can expect. Uh, in the pyrite-rich areas, typically they'll be high with magnetite. Uh, so we can get, to, if we're low down on the system, we may actually get a halo type effect coming out in the magnetics. Um, if we're running a uh, radiometric survey, the porphyritic or the uh, potassic core will be high in potassium and we'll start to see where the potassium is migrated, we'll get a zonation there as well. All of these can be clues as to where one is in these larger mineralizing systems. So the first case history is a fairly simple one. It's a well-known deposit, Alumbrera in Argentina. And it's one which is, uh, the alteration has been mapped out uh, we've got 
proplytic, philic, and potassic alteration. Each of these has its own distinct geophysical response. Um, there's three main areas in this deposit. There's the Colorado Norte, which is a high-grade uh, buried zone. There's Los Amarillos, which is uh, another high-grade zone. And then there's a low-grade conductive core, which is essentially uh, in the bracketed area on the left. If we look at the geophysics of, of this area, and these are all scaled to the same scale, um, we have the alteration map again. We can see from the magnetics that we've got a magnetic high that is situated over the core of the deposit, and we're getting a circular ring uh, structure in the areas of magnetite uh, destruction in the philicon uh, propylictic cores. Uh, potassium, similar sort of response. Again, because this one happens to be a, a potassium rich core, we get a potassium anomaly centered over over the middle, and we can see the zones of destruction, which again correlate to the other areas of alteration. Uh, resistivity, similar response. Uh, we get conductive minerals around the outer edges, or uh, mineralogy, so we have a, a conductive zone on the outside, and the internal is, uh, or actually, sorry, the color scheme is reversed on this. Internal, the dark blue on the resistivity map is actually very conductive, and then we get, a, again, a halo feature on the outside. Um, this deposit is also contained and mimicked uh, the outline pretty much by the topography of the area as well. So there's all these clues that can be used and brought in together to figure out where we are within the system. Um, if we look at an IP section across this one, the chargeability model, is giving us conductive highs in the, in the uh, near surface. This is the bright reds. Uh, in areas where there's been extensive alteration, which is indicated by the black veins, which have been mapped out in this particular case. Again, in the resistivity, uh, in, this, in this case, the hot colors are actually the conductive zones. We can start to see what might actually be a bit of a halo starting to appear again. So if this was expanded across the entire deposit and viewed and planned, we might actually be able to start to map out some of the zonation that's going on within the deposit. Uh, Santa Cecilia in Chile. This is an interesting one. This is uh, in an area of intense hydrothermal alt alteration, but also extreme topography. There's over a kilometer of topography on this deposit. The main mineral mineralization is gold, silver, and copper. Uh, this is a challenge both geophysically, because of that kilometer difference, but also, again, if you take Silito's model and now you uh, drape a topographic surf, uh, surface over top, uh, you can start to see where you're going to cut different phases of the model, you're going to get a different response, and uh, it'll be quite interesting to see what actually comes out of it. So this is an example exactly of that, where uh, we have the high alteration zone in pink, which is in the near surface, which is usually one of the better geophysical targets. But each of the other zones has its own analog in this particular area here. So with the host rock, we can define it as having a high resistivity, no chargeability, moderate mag susceptibility. Uh, the stockwork veining, which is highlighted by the uh, red zones in the uh, geologic model on the left. Um, it's, they tend to have moderate resistivity, a low chargeability, and a moderate mag sus, uh, susceptibility. And in uh, most of the major alteration zones, it's low to moderate in resistivity, moderate to high in chargeability, and low in magnetic susceptibility in this particular case. Uh, there was a large number of surveys that were completed over this deposit. There was ground magnetics, which delineated alteration zones. Uh, this was also inverted into 3D. There was a mobile metal ion survey, uh, which identified gold and copper anomalies. Uh, there was a controlled source audio magnetotelluric survey. Um, this is where you put a large bipole out on the ground about five to 10 kilometers away and you survey over your deposit. Um, this can be effective down to depths of maybe 700 meters. And it mapped out a large conductive body. There was limited diamond drilling two holes, both went through a very major mineralized zone. And this was all followed up um, in the following years with a large uh, Orion 3D 
uh, IP and magnetotelluric survey to better try to define the entire mineralizing system. So the ground magnetic date, data, um, the pull reduced data, gives, which is the RTP in the upper right, or upper left, sorry, it gives you an idea, uh, mostly that it's not a very magnetic body, but there are some zones going in there. It it's, gives you just a hint of what's going on. When we do a second vertical derivative, now we're seeing the extent of the alteration zone of the magnetite destruction. We're mapping pretty much the outline of the actual porphyry body as mapped from the geology. If we model the magnetic data in 3D and we look at the susceptibility output, we see that we have a magnetic core in two areas. We have it in, uh, in the main core area, but also in one of the other uh, alteration zones. From the controlled source audio magnetotelluric survey, this was again, it was a, just a survey to see if there was a larger conductive body present. Um, there was a very strong conductor which came up on these four little lines that were completed at the time. It's at depth, it's under about uh, 100 to 200 meters worth of cover, and it's actually horseshoe shaped. And again, if we look at it in, in 3D, the uh, pinkish blob in there is actually the CSAMT conductive body. And now we have the uh, MMI results overlaying on top of it. And from the contours, we see that the contours for high uh, in both gold and copper are mimicking to a certain extent the uh, CSAMT result. So this is a pretty good correlation between the two and suggesting that we're onto the right track. Um, again, if we slice this and we look at it in 3D, um, this was used as the basis for the first two drill holes. The drill holes have been plotted on here with the colors essentially showing the mineralization. Uh, what's important to note here is they drill through the CSAMT anomaly, they drill through the MMI anomaly, and they actually uh, had very good results. Uh, but what this also showed is that the mineralization continued to, to a depth greater than what was capable of being mapped out using just the controlled source audio magnetotellurics. So the next step here was to essentially blanket the area and do a full-on 3D uh, resistivity and IP survey and also collect magnetotelluric data. Unfortunately, the upper left slide doesn't really show the cluster of points but there was over 500 uh, received dipoles, that were, or over 300 receiver dipoles that were set up. These were permanently left, covering uh, the area to be explored. And there was over 500 current injections. What this did was this created a cloud of about 150,000 data points. So we're starting to talk about very big data, about a terabyte in the field of raw data. And uh, we've got the, what I'm showing here is the apparent resistivity and the IP chargeability from that cloud. So this is the entire cloud cluster. In the upper right, the green dots indicate where the uh, magnetotelluric stations were set up. And that's roughly the same area as to how the uh, DCIP survey was set up. There's some areas of the train which were just too steep uh, the advantage of going to 3D is with most of the systems, they're extremely flexible in how you can set up your coverage. So if you've got a steep valley, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you can adapt it essentially to the terrain. Now by gathering all this data, going through editing the data out, and then inverting it in 3D and completing what's called the sensitivity analysis so that we're only looking at the area of the data which we have the highest confidence that it's valid, um, we can start to see from the resistivity on the left and from the chargeability on the right, we, we're starting to see that circular pattern again that we were expecting from the geologic mapping and from the alteration and zonation uh, in this particular area. If we take a slice out of this so that we're actually looking into our 3D model, which is what the lower images are showing, this highlights that ring structure uh, just a little bit more, and the conductive core in the, in the main portion of the, uh, of the body. 
if we start to overlay uh, the general outline from, from the geology, um, and as we start to take depth slices going through the body and th from the inversion, we can start to see a correlation between, uh, again, this ring structure starting to come out, which is giving us the alteration and where the main core is, but also in the IP chargeability, we're starting to see some down dip extent of uh, the veins that were mapped out at surface. So we're starting to get a very nice picture of where we are in this particular porphyry. Now the magnetotelluric allows us to look much deeper. In most cases, we can image down to three kilometers without too much difficulty. It's generally a coarse image, but what it does is it allows us to look at what may be the entire mineralizing system. So this helps in, in determining are we in the best spot based on our closer to surface material, or is this just a small pod that's part of a much bigger body? Um, so we, again, we invert in 3D, we get this huge cube. We can take slices across so we can start to see the main conductive core coming out. If we slice down, again, we start to see the ring structure that's coming out. The MT is actually doing a reasonable job in, in uh, mapping this out and correlation to some of the uh, alteration zones quite well. If we then bring in the DC resistivity, which is shallower, it merges almost perfectly in this case with the magnetotelluric. So now we've got the near surface definition from the DCIP coupled with the deeper looking magnetotellurics. So now we're starting to see the entire, get a better feel for what the entire system may actually be. And we can actually see potentially a feeder zone uh, going right through with depth and maybe an offset satellite on one side here with depth. And if we bring in the control source audio magnetotellurics, we can now see that uh, that's the um, purple surface in, this, in these images. It's a conductivity shell, 10 nanometers. And if we bring it in, we can see that the magnetotellurics has actually mapped it out much deeper. And then where the drill holes actually come through, uh, the mineralization in the drill holes is almost matching the the conductivity shell almost perfectly. And this is with completely unconstrained inversions. The next stage to do is to take this limited geologic data, use it to control the inversions and see if we can even do a better job of defining what uh, the actual body and system may be. The next case history, um, Yerokucha, for, for those of you that know it, this has not been recognized formally really as a porphyry. But there is a porphyry body that's associated with this. Um, the workings in Yerakuja are really quite remarkable. It covers quite a large area. Um, the main ore zones are indicated in red along here that were known and what they've mined. All of these networks here are underground tunnels, which they've uh, completed to connect up all of these zones, and this is on a 500 meter by 500 meter square. So that's a fairly large area. Um, it's an active mine. It's a challenge for doing geophysics because it's a high noise environment. Uh, in this particular case, um, it's also an extremely difficult one for topography. Again, it's uh, not exactly flat country. And uh, some of the area wasn't too bad and was actually quite nice to survey over, but you still had to get up and over some of these peaks here. And uh, that's sort of the surface expression of what one had to deal with in this particular area. The entire trend where they had been mining was covered again with a large uh, Titan survey in this case. So this is 2D lines of uh, IP, uh, pole, dipole, pole, uh, set up so that uh, we're looking deep, large offset. Uh, the IP data was severely limited by the high noise environment due to all of the electric uh, equipment that they were operating in actual mine operations. And what we're going to be looking at in particular is one line, line 14 north. 
Uh, what we have on the, on the left here is the geologic section that the mine had put together. Uh, they had one zone here, their QEO or QE ore body, which they had defined from underground, and they knew that they had a contact between uh, an igneous unit and their sedimentary structure in the monzonites here. Um, but the magnetotellurics uh, showed that, yes, their main body was in a much larger conductive horizon. They knew that this area here was mineralized. So they were extremely curious as to what was going on in this and what, what's the extent of this here because they had no drilling into it. They actually drilled it from underground from one of their tunnels and on the one hole that they did put into it, they did intersect uh, some pretty high, some pretty good grades, like over 0.5% copper in the hole there. And what they also recognized was that this was actually a porphyry. So this changed their whole idea of what they were looking at and how they were going to move forward in this particular area. And it's opened up this entire conductive area here for more drilling and the possibility that they've got a much bigger deposit than what they originally thought. So this is sort of the utility of going in with these deep looking methods in an area which is mature, which is under operation, and uh, it can lead to quite a bit. So whenever they started uh, going through the, the remaining data, they started to map out what they think is the surficial extent of this porphyry zone. And this is just some of the uh, assay values that they've pulled out from that one hole that they drilled from underground into this very large MT conductor. Okay, I've really got a whip here. Uh, well, I'm on the last one, so this is okay. Uh, Vine Project, this is SEDEX deposit in BC. It's uh, possibly on strike with Sullivan. It's very interesting. It's sitting in a, uh, possibly an extension of the Sullivan uh, Graben in this particular area. This has seen magnetotelluric uh, limited and just recently it's been completed in 3D or in a much more extensive coverage for 3D. Uh, there's gravity, detailed gravity, there's ground mag, there's airborne VTEM and mag. Uh, quite a bit has been done in this area, but again, and this comes to compiling everything together. Gravity showed a very dense anomaly in this particular area here, which is uh, right in that particular area. Geologic uh, section that was drawn for going through that area was suggesting that, and limited historic drilling was suggesting that there might be a body in the area where that gravity anomaly was, and that it's probably controlled by the Moyer Fault, which is this very major fault which crosscuts through the area. And uh, again, inverting the magnetotelluric data in 2D, you know, it was picking up this conductive body quite nicely. Uh, shallower one, which matched what came out of the gravity modeling uh, for deeper, uh, possibly folded and flat-lying sulfides, which were uh, encountered in the drilling and the shallower body. So there was good correlation between the two. Um, doing some more slicing, the large MT with, uh, it seems to be matching with the mag in the upper part, so the mag isn't looking as deep. Again, good, good correlation. And when we bring in the, uh, the drilling data and the geology, and we put all this, combine it all into a 3D perspective, we can now uh, really see what has been coming up. Hopefully this is gonna work, this is, yes, this is an animation. Uh, so right now, this is the magnetic uh, cube, the 3D magnetic cube. We've got 2D sections of the uh, magnetotellurics. And uh, there's also the, some of the surficial geology that's in this and uh, a couple of lines of uh, ground EM. Uh, we'll spin it around again. So you can start to get a feel for what the entire system is and uh, now we'll be slicing through the gravity cube. And you can start to see what the correlation with some of these uh, anomalies are. So we've got a dense but non-conductive body which is tying into the drilling results which were indicating sphalerite. 
Um, uh, where the conductive body is, it's tying in with, uh, uh, with uh, pyrite and with, uh, uh, with other conductive mineralization. So it's, it's starting to come together as a very nice story. So in conclusion, with most porphyries, uh, they'll have a highly magnetic core. Not all. There's uh, some in some parts of the world which have a non-magnetic core. But the big thing is, is that you'll get, as, you'll get zones of magnetite enrichment and destruction. So you can start to map out where you are. If there's a resistive silica cap over the more profli ah, porphyritic parts of the deposit, you will get high chargeability which is generally related to the disseminated sulfides. The radiometrics can help map out your potassic alteration zones. Uh, putting it all into 3D, combining it with uh, 3D MT can be extremely powerful. Uh, it's possible to start to map out your alteration zones, where you are in the system, and quite probably where you should be going to next. And the deeper methods allow you to get a much larger picture of what's actually going on. And it's important to be able to integrate your geochemistry and your geologic sections at this point, bring it all in, start to refine the model, see what more you can bring out of it. Um, this will provide new insight into the validity of your geologic models and can really bring things along quite a bit. And uh, I've included a bunch of acknowledgements to the various people that have helped over time putting this together, but also some uh, selected references that I'd recommend that uh, if you have the time and the inclination to go through and uh, pull out because they are very good. Thank you.